He said he failed over and over and over again in his career, and that's the only reason he succeeded. So every time I would fail, I had this quote. Actually, I wrote it on the the mirror, and I said, I said, as bad as I would feel, I'm like, well, you know, if Michael Jordan's saying this, he's he must be on to something because I think he did pretty well in his in his area of life with with his uh, career. So I I would always just be like, all right, well. I guess I'll keep going and fail again. Hi, and welcome. It's Runchex, and you're listening to my podcast where I explore the topics around what it takes to become a great poker player with various interesting people from in and around poker industry. Today, my guest is David Reichelt, the creator of Color Switch. It's a hugely popular mobile game. It generated over $75 million in revenue, and it's a fascinating success story. He got into game creation by accident and had to work really hard to hit the home run. David shares some great tips, and I find his story very inspiring. We talk about a lot of things in this one, the creative process, persistence, finding your passion, and so much more. And of course, we also take a look at the poker industry and the trend of making poker more fun. As always, feel free to jump around the topics. There's something for everyone in this conversation. And actually, we talked with David for quite a long time before we officially got to the episode. Unfortunately, we didn't record the whole conversation, but we have part of it, and so we start with that. Enjoy. And you know, you know how they say there, there's a saying: "Do you never repeat the same trick twice?" Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's for me. There's two reasons why. One is just like you, you said: we're not, we don't often have these experiences where you're surprised. And so, if I do the trick for you one time, the surprise is a hundred percent. If mm-hmm. I do it a second time for you. I'm not worried about you figuring it out. What I learned after making that mistake is that the level of excitement and surprise is lower the next time because Mm -hmm. you already experienced it. And so there's no way to match the first time. And so I, so I know if I do a trick again for someone, I'm kind of ruining it because Mm -hmm. the memory won't be as strong because now they, they have multiple experience of the same thing. And so mm-hmm. that's for me, the two reasons I don't repeat a trick is a, I want to make sure that the experience is, uh, is at the kind of like optimal level that it can be for, as I think about it going on. And then the second, the second, um, the second reason I think escaped me. <laughs> <laughs> might be because it's so early but uh it 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 could be maybe it's because so i mean the lesser of the important things is someone could possibly figure something out or you know because they're not kind of now they they know what's coming they can like kind of like look around and Mm -hmm. but there's some things i do there's so many moving parts um that there's no you might catch one thing but you won't know how anything works Mm -hmm. but still Someone, if they see something in their mind, they'll connect it to B when it's actually F and they'll right. think, oh, of course I got it. And they mm-hmm. didn't get it, but in their mind, they're convinced they got it. So right, it's, right. uh, but the main reason is because you want to leave them with this powerful experience. And the more you experience anything, mm-hmm. um, like the first time we had, a, you know, the first time, let's say iPhone one came out, everyone, Steve Jobs was saying, look, you can scroll Everyone in the crowd was like, wow. Now, if this one, I said, hey, check it out. You can scroll even faster. But, uh, well, yeah, for the last 10 years, you can scroll. Right, so, right. big deal. So, it's kind of, you know, every experience is like that in that um, the more you experience mm-hmm. something, the less effect it has on you. So Right. And especially, I guess, the, the perception, the first time you're watching a trick, Especially if you come with a skeptical approach to it, you're you're just yeah. looking to get the approval, like to sort of verify your expectations that this is not going to be impressive. So when it, yeah. it ends up being impressive and surprising, this is a huge yeah. thing for you. If you watch the same trick the second time, now you're just working on a kind of human curiosity of okay, yeah. let me try to figure it out. Which is a completely yeah. different experience, you know, when you're yeah. looking at a trick, because most people, even if they seeing the trick for the first time, even if they approach it with like, I'm going to try to figure this out, I'm going to catch 
uh, the move. You know, usually it just hurts them more because they're just too focused on the places where the, the misdirection happens, right? So they yeah, miss yeah. the real thing, right? Yeah. But yeah, I can totally see why showing the same trick twice is not a good idea. I mean, obviously, unless you show it the second time with a twist, which surprises them in a completely different way, but then it's a different trick, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's uh, it is and it, it is fat to me. It's uh, watching a magic trick. It's almost like, like you said, you know, people. You were you were talking about earlier about how people listen to Richard and they get, then they they kind of like they look into like card magic or whatever, and they they're they're all into that. And there's this, you know, they're they're it's something they never got into. But uh, for me, um, close up magic when you actually see it, it's it's. It's kind of like when I listen to Mozart, it, it it sounds like it always existed. It's just this perfect sounding piece of music. And so when you see really good magic performed, it seems like it just visually you get it. And it just, when you see it perform really well, it just seems like that must have always existed. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things to the, whatever you would call that phenomenon, but but just like the sun, the sun just seems like it's always been there doing its thing. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and, and, uh, I think, I think the sun Mozart close up, really good close up magic or a stage show or whatever, when it's performed really well, and maybe anything when, when something's performed really well and someone makes it look easy, it does feel like that, like it, Oh, that must've always existed. And there's a power in that, I guess there is a, uh, like Pac-Man, seems like it always existed it's only existed right. for 40 years right um and uh and uh it just you know something seems so natural um and 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 i guess you know always existing in in some fashion and it's uh you know magic is one of those for sure or or richard you know being that mythical creature just yeah. he must have been dealing seconds in the womb that you know he's <laughs> yeah so good at it, it makes it look yeah, so easy yeah. Yeah, it's incredible. His whole work ethic and the perception of, you know, the commitment to excellence. It's Oh, and I can I can attest I like I said I was with him daily on a number of occasions but but in in South Africa, you know, well actually no, even before that, the first time I ever met Richard, I picked him up from the airport, gets in the back of the truck. First thing he does, he gets out his pad and he starts dealing seconds. Mm -hmm. And that theme of him just working on something all the time has persisted anytime I've, I've ever been ha hanging out with him. And if he's not working on his cards, he wants to go into the gym. And if he's not doing that, then he's just sitting there talking to you, uh, kind of dissecting and thinking about whatever concept he has in his mind. So he, he, he's always on in some fashion, whether it's, mm -hmm. He never wastes time, I guess, is is the the idea. And so you can, and then seeing what he does live, like even when when he's practicing, you're seeing something he does in his show, and and uh, you're seeing this amazing thing that he's just always doing, and uh, and because he has that that aspect to his personality, um, is the only reason any of us know about him. Mm -hmm. I mean, when he went, when he had, when he lost his sight as a kid, he could have had the kind of victim mentality felt, Oh, woe is me. And then not, not worked on himself in various ways. And we never would have known him. So it's pretty, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it just, it's a good reminder. It's like, man, whatever challenge you're going through, how about losing an actual sense that you have or yeah. someone who loses their legs or there's some Australian, um, public speaker and he, he, he doesn't have any arms or legs, very powerful speaker. And, Mm -hmm. He skydives, he goes on speedboats, he does everything. And he actually was talking in my town a couple of years ago, a uh, very inspiring guy, but it's like, you know, it's just a good reminder to, to think, okay, whatever I'm complaining about or whatever I'm feeling sorry about myself for, you really don't have an excuse because here there are plenty of people who, uh, who don't have all the assets that you have, whether physically or mentally or whatever. And here they are doing crazy things that you're not doing. And, and because they're not, yeah. you know, there's, a, and he talks about that in thinker toys, there's two kinds of minds. There's the kitten and there's the monkey. 
a kitten, when it gets in trouble, it starts uh, mewing for its mom and it just sits there. A monkey, when it's in trouble, goes and finds its mom. So you can sit there and complain and not solve your problem, or you can go find the solution to your problem like the monkey does. So, you know, he says, these, these techniques are for monkeys. And if you're a kitten, then you might as well close the book. And that's life in a nutshell. You got to, you have to have, you're the, you have the mind of a kitten or the mind of a monkey. Yeah. It's interesting though, if, you know, we have a fixed mind, you know, because what I think about when I think about Richard or other people who had major adversity in their life, right? Yeah. They achieved what they achieved despite what happened. And obviously, majority yeah. of people in their situation, they achieve nothing. They actually go into the despair and they go into depression and, you know, life is miserable yeah. and unfair, et cetera, et cetera, which would be a natural human reaction. And, you know, most of us would uh, experience that in some f- shape or form. And Richard actually was uh, quite angry with the world in, in, in the beginning as, as he tells his story, right? But he switched and he decided, yeah. well, enough is enough. I'm, I'm going to, you know, this is not an obstacle I can't overcome. And he used yeah. it as the fuel, right? Yeah. Maybe people switch. Maybe, you know, an event or a sequence of events allows us to switch, see the world from a different perspective, you know, become a monkey, not not a kid. And, and um, yeah, it's interesting, you know, all these human triggers, why does somebody all of a sudden decide to be excellent? Because to be excellent, that has to be a decision. It's a choice. Yes. Yeah, there's nothing but a choice. Obviously, you know, for some people, if you choose the wrong field where you want to be excellent, well, you know, you might choose something that is out of your reach. You know, say if you decide, if I decide I want to be an excellent NBA player, that's probably not going to happen, right? I'm just Mm -hmm. not tall enough, not fast enough, and I'm too old now, right? So tough luck. But if you choose a field, where you have the potential, well, then it's just a choice. And you, know, you go ahead. And, and Richard practiced, what, 16 hours a day for 20 odd years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. And I would say, yeah. And that's it. And you, you, you're right. You can go between mindsets. You could be a kitten. You could evolve to the monkey mindset or a, maybe, a, you know, there's probably people who have some setback and they do evolve back to that mindset. But you, yeah, you, uh, you can, what was it? I forget where the quote's from, but it said the most, the most wealthy place in the world is the graveyard because that's where most people died with their dreams. They never made them a reality. So they're, they're there like buried treasure, um, Mm. that no one can really dig up. Um, but, but so it could be, you know, people didn't, actually take action or they took action in the wrong area and they didn't realize the mismatch. But, um, I think when, when you do take action and you really excel above your peers, it really, I think the, the, the other secret thing, which Jesse shell talks about in his book is the passion for it. He said, you know, there's a big difference between technical skill and then someone who has the passion on top of, of that, because the passion will take you, um, uh, beyond what someone with a technical skill has. And so, you know, like, uh, 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 you know, Richard, for example, having that passion that drives his actions 24 seven is how he, it has no peers essentially, you know, there's, there's, um, card slides you can do that a magician knows that most people can learn. Mm-hmm. Some are very simple. You can learn in a day. Some take a couple months. But the what he does, which is on a much more microscopic level, is so hard that you have to, if you don't have a passion for it, it's not going to happen. And so that is, uh, I really like how Jesse talks about that. When you have that passion, what that means is you have something inside you that's driving you to not only take action all the time and improve what you're doing, but also taking in information and analyze it from all these different ways. And okay, why am I not getting the result that I, I wanted? What can I do better next time? And constantly going through this mental process 
Um, but the, the passion is the fuel that makes that process keep going. Because if you, if you get into something like, oh, I want to make a ton of money because, you know, and do this. Like there are so many people who got into apps because of that. And then they got burnt out because guess what? It's a lot of work. It takes, you know, uh, time to develop skills in, um, in, uh, in a variety of ways to, to make something that people want to use on their phone. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have the passion for it, you'll burn out quick because there's no, there's no real, uh, fuel that you have with depth. It's, it's a very superficial fuel. Um, um, and so, and so I always think of passion when I think of all these people who are excelling in different ways, when you look at the details and you kind of peel away the layers, you're like, Oh, that person's passionate. Mm-hmm. And that's always, it's always there. Topic of passion actually is an interesting one. Cause how do we identify, are there different forms of passion? Cause let me tell you why I'm asking this. Cause sometimes you see somebody very passionate or seemingly passionate about a project, like fully immersed. They wake up with like, this is my thing. and But the motivation is somewhat external. They're chasing a goal. You know, what, very often what happens is when you reach that goal, you sort of reach a point of, okay, and now what? You know, because yeah. s- sort of you reach the goal and well, you know, Where do I go next? And it's usually ends up being slightly disappointing. And, you know, we see a lot of people create a multi-million, billion dollar business, sell it, and then go and sink into depression or or some such thing. You know, seemingly ridiculous because, hey, you achieved everything you wanted. Just to realize that actually that's not what I was going for. That the process was the, the interesting part. The building the, the business, being the creator, bringing out the ideas, that was what was driving me. But, you know. Yeah. And some people seem to be just passionate about something without seemingly any external motivation. Like they don't care what other people are going to think about it. And they're just doing it for themselves, for their own fulfillment. Sure. Do you think both of these things are passion? What is the definition of passion, actually? Like, how do you see it? Um, I just, I just view it as it's. There's something you, you, you don't know what you're passionate about, and oftentimes until you see it or you experience it, and so, um. For someone, for every person, it's something different. Like Michael Jordan was passionate about uh, basketball. Wayne Gretzky is passionate about hockey. Richard Turner is passionate about card cheating. Um, everyone, it has all sorts of, of uh, different visuals, but I think the inner thing is the same in that there is something that you're connecting with for some reason that really excites you. It's kind of like, uh, uh, you know, if you saw it, like if I saw, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going, uh, let's say I'm walking around the mall and I just see all these people. And finally, there's one girl that stands out because she's just very beautiful. And there's something in me that wants to go talk to her because I'm just inspired by by uh, what I'm seeing. And it'd be, you know, you want to go talk to her or something and, and meet her. So there's something, so she, the, the beautiful girl, the beautiful woman is the, the metaphor for something that, that you didn't know you were looking for it, but as soon as you see it, it, it excites something inside of you, you get, and, 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 and you get this kind of like burning passion and you want to explore that you want to, you want to, um, you know, you want to attain this goal or that goal. So I, I think it's just because like, I'm never going to be a doctor. I'm never going to be a world-class poker player. I'm never going to be uh, dealing seconds like Richard Turner. Uh, but there are things and there's not just one thing like, like I'm passionate about games. I'm actually passionate about filmmaking. I want to um, uh, start a production company when the time comes. Um, and there, there's a, there's a ton of different things. And I think when you reach goals, like you said, you can either stop there and get depressed or you can realize, oh, there's other goals that I wasn't even aware of. And so I think you always, if you're always on the look for things that interest you, things that you connect with, 
then you can ignite passion for other things that you didn't even know you had because you hadn't seen it yet. Because there doesn't just have to be that one person out there that that um, ignites his passion. Uh, you know, you could you could um, you could as you as you go through life and you experience things, you could. You, I think there's always more things that can ignite this passion inside of you in different ways. So it's just that phenomenon where something you see or feel or hear, you don't, you can't, it's almost like you can't explain it. You don't know why it, it has that effect on you because it doesn't have an effect on someone else, but for some reason it has that effect on you and you feel it. And when you feel it and acknowledge it, and that I think that's also why there's so many people who are unhappy because like you said, they mismatch with a career. Maybe they're working in an office or uh, maybe they are a millionaire or a billionaire, but they're not doing something that, that they're passionate about. And so, um, and so they're miserable and you're like, well, why are you miserable? You, you got a nice house, you got plenty of money and this and that. They're just not doing something they actually enjoy. Or maybe, and I think, I, I think uh, you know, it reminds me of an article I read. It said the number one indicator of a long life is your, the quality of your relationships with people, whether it's a stranger or a family member or a friend. I think when you are not just doing things for yourself and you're actually doing things for other people, that, that is just going to make you feel better in general. And, um, and I think, I think like uh, was Alexander the Great, he was depressed when he conquered everything, right? And I think, uh, I don't know if he, I can't remember if he committed suicide, but uh, from what I recall about him, he got really depressed because there was nothing else to do. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, so I, I think there is something to where if you don't just stop at one goal, but you see that there is an infinite amount of goals that you can always connect with, and then also not just, I think a key is not just doing something for yourself. Like Richard doesn't just do seconds for himself. He inspires people. He takes care of his family. You know, he, 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 you know, he, he's, he's taught his son, um, as he's grown and, and he, you know, he didn't just do all this for himself. And so, um, I think oftentimes when you see someone successful, who's happy, if you looked at the details, they're not just doing something for themselves. They're always doing it for other people, whether it's their family or, or using their failures to inspire other people. So I think, I think, um, yeah, there's that phenomenon of you connecting with something that ignites this feeling you have. That's one thing. And then the other is just not just doing things for yourself. Um, and, and actually, you know, doing things for other people, I think is, I think are two, two keys to, to, um, not being miserable because <laughs> right. it was, I, I, I'd been there where I just focused on myself completely and it's just miserable. It's not fun. <clears throat> and, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I don't know about you, but I, I get pretty tired of myself. You know, I don't want to be, uh, you know, thinking or doing things for myself all the time. But, um, I think I would say those are things I think about when I think of passion is, is uh is uh those two kind of key ideas yeah it's very interesting what you've you've mentioned about you know what do you do for others yeah because if i think back at what's happening with what i'm doing which is recently i'm, I'm doing this i'm doing the podcast you know and that's this, this yeah. is the thing that i enjoy i'm really looking forward to every next conversation i never know what it's gonna amount to i never know where it's gonna lead us i'm not scripting things i'm just discovering with an open mind of what's going on right and as a professional poker player on the other hand me and pretty much everybody else who is a professional poker player it's such an individual thing you know you might have a team around you of people you work with uh, study the game together um, you know, push each other forward. But for the most part, it's an individual sport where, you know, you're just focused on your on your selfish goals, so to say. So to me, you know, to switch, well, not switch, but add this extra dimension, you know, something that I do for others. I mean, first, first and foremost, I'm having these conversations for myself because I'm just enjoying them. But yeah. it's also so enjoyable to see that it impacts other people in some way, you know, and I never know 
what way? Because, you know, from the same episode, from the same conversation that I'm having with somebody, 10 different people are going to watch it or listen to it. And they might have 10 different perspectives of what was the mo most interesting part of it. What was the most impactful thing? Because obviously we all are on a different uh, well, different stage in our life, right? So the things that we pay attention to are ov obviously always different. So to me, it, it is absolutely rewarding and, and so pleasant to see that, you know, I can just with doing something that I enjoy to do, it also helps other people. It's just, it's just so great. And I, yeah. I, st I started writing a weekly newsletter to the people who, who subscribe to it, uh, putting out my key takeaways from each conversation that I had. Because I know that, you know, my key takeaways might be quite different to what they took away. And sometimes, right. you know, they would read what I think about it and uh, they would comment and like, hey, but also this and that thing, you know, did you think about that? And it's interesting because when I'm getting that feedback, it's quite rewarding. And at the same time, for some people, it might be something that they missed. You know, and they go back to it and, you know, so it's a fuller experience for them. So, yeah, I'm, I'm having a lot of fun with these things. Mm -hmm. um, so and that's the fun know. thing I guess in general is <clears throat> you can, as long as you, and it kind of, I guess maybe you can connect it to why, you know, to what I was saying about having new goals come in that you can connect with and mm -hmm. kind of still at that passion in different ways. As long as you're, I think the key thing is always being a, that constant student um, and you're always learning new things. I think that's also going to counteract you getting depressed or, or whatnot. Did you see that movie? Um, uh, was it uh, uh, Ready Player One? No, no. What is it? Uh, pretty good movie. It's about, <clears throat> it's a futuristic movie about um, when. Uh, you know, a uh, future society where everyone's playing VR and competing and everyone, everyone is uh, able to compete for money, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But it's based off of the novel called Ready Player One. It was directed by Steven Spielberg. And I just remember there was an actor on there. He's like, yeah, you know, all this new technology. Uh, I'm too old for this. And I, you know, I don't really get it, but Steven, and it cuts to Steven Spielberg and he's on the ground with the VR and he's, you know, doing all this stuff. The guy's like, he's like a kid. He's, he's like a, um, and it, it makes sense because, you know, he's so passionate about filmmaking. He's even, even though he's a multi-billionaire, he's had all these hits, he's still learning. He's still a student. He's still playing around and he's still, he has a very um, uh, bendable mind and that he's not rigid and stuck in this way and that so that it was funny hearing this actor who was admitting like, yeah, you know, I don't really get all this stuff. Uh, you know, this, this is not my era, but Steven on the other hand is like a, this kid with this stuff. He just gets it. And, uh, so I think there is something, a big, something really big to say about the student mindset as opposed to someone who thinks they don't have anything else to learn. Like I went to college, I got that plaque, that degree, boom, on my wall. I'm the master at this. And really you're never going to be a master at anything. There's always something new to learn. Mm -hmm. And so seeing someone like Steven Spielberg just sitting there and still learning, it's like, Oh, okay. If Steven still is still learning. That means I definitely can be learning because I'm nowhere near that level. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Yeah. And like you said, it's, you know, the guy is a billionaire. Like seemingly, yeah. he he doesn't have external motivation. Like he doesn't need an extra hundred thousand. I mean, it's probably nice to have, but doesn't change his life one way or another. Yeah. But he still goes for excellence. He still goes for immersion. If he's gonna do yeah. something, he's gonna do it the right way. And yeah, it it is just so beautiful to see because you see that somebody is fulfilling what they're supposed to do sort of pursuing their yeah. their purpose you know if we go yeah. philosophical on the whole the whole thing how did you get into designing games a uh, complete accident actually uh i moved in i was actually a theater major at the time uh 2013 and i moved into through uh through a, i had a friend 
in the theater program who was moving out of her apartment. She posted about it on Facebook, asking for someone to take over her lease. So I wanted, to, I wanted to, at the time I was working as a magician also, and I wanted to be closer to Hollywood, which has the Magic Castle. So I thought, oh, if I go in the Magic Castle a lot, I can start getting clientele by doing uh, my shows there. And, uh, and she lived about five minutes away from it. So that was my motivation. And then she still had her roommate living there. And when I moved in, the first day I came out of my room, I saw he was at his computer working on something. And then I uh, asked him about it and he was making a game. He was outsourcing the development to a programmer and, and whatnot. And I, I guess I always assumed you had to know how to program to make a game or anything with, you know, software. And, uh, and I don't have an interest in programming, so, um, I never got into it. And so when I saw that, oh, you could outsource this stuff, I, I, uh, I thought, you know, I've been playing games my whole life. I think I could excel at this. And it kind of went from there, you know, that was, uh, basically how I got started in it. And it was just a complete, it felt like a random occurrence. Cause I, I had never, I never designed anything intentionally. I never had, um, there's never had a high technical skill in anything and just, you know, I just happened to have a roommate who was making games and then went from there. All right. So you got into it and I know your story starts with 40 unsuccessful games or financial unsuccessful yes. games. Now talk me through it. Like how does that happen? So you're creating games, obviously pursuing the passion. The, the first game that you considered that you created, what did you feel that, okay, this is a game that's, that's going to make it. Did you have that feeling yeah. or were you just every iterating? time? Every time. Yeah. Every time I was like, this will be number one. Um, and my first game was, uh, a game called baby three horns, great escape about these two dinosaurs who had to escape some hungry cavemen. Okay. And, uh, you know, I was, I was just, to me, I was creating, um, ET. I was creating this epic giant movie that everyone would, would, uh, you know, this, this game that everyone would be playing. So I hired an artist and outsourced the development and whatnot. Spent six months and $4,000 on this game, uh, made 75 bucks. So not quite the epic, almost not quite. And, uh, but you know, I, I, I just thought, okay, how can I get a better result next time? And, and I, I didn't have $4,000 to spend again. I had sold some of some equipment. I had some film equipment to fund it and I didn't have any more thing, anything else to sell. So I just, um, I just said, okay, well I will, learn how to make games myself and I won't have to outsource it and I can save that money in that time. Mm -hmm. So I started learning some really simple software, built a bunch of games. And every time I made a game, I would think, Oh, this is it. Like if I made a game that was, uh, birds versus ninjas, I'm like people love ninjas. They love birds. Of course this is going to be a hit. And you know, I just kept on. So the, you know, when I first made games, I, I kind of went off of themes I thought people would, would like, or popular things that were trending or whatever. And it was usually superficial, um, I guess, starts to those games, you know, nothing of too much substance. And what I learned after making those 40 games is that, okay, People aren't playing these games. Why? What am I doing wrong? And I, I said, okay. Um, I, I, I just remember one day I had a thought and I said, you know what? Instead of making a game that no one's plays, what, how, how could I make a game that not only would people play it, but it, 40 years later, they'd be playing it. And I had this very specific thought. And that's the key is I learned to be specific with, with uh, my, um, my challenge or my problem solving. So I said, okay. Uh, I want to make a game that could be around for 40 years. Maybe I should look at games that have been around for 40 years. And, um, and that's how I designed uh, color switch. Um, that same day when I had that thought, that very specific, I want to make a game that can be around, uh, in 40 years. Um, when I had that thought that same day, I designed a bunch of ideas until I got to that one and I can get into what those inspirations were for that game, but that's kind of how it evolved. But every single time I just thought, Oh, this will be the big hit. And I would put all my energy into it and it wouldn't happen. 
I always kept on thinking, okay, what am I missing? And I would always have that thought, what am I missing? What do I need to learn? And I would just keep on, you know, working on learning from a variety of sources so I could have a better result each time. Mm. I find it beautiful that, you know, what it took for you was to, well, obviously the whole process was gradual and you were building up your expertise and understanding of what's going on. But the shift in perception of what you're trying to achieve, that little extra in 40 years, people are still going to play it. You know, that changed the whole thing for you that I find it really beautiful. It's a, it's, it, it seems like such a small idea but it get it got such a big result. I mean, if I showed you, I made these horrible dentist games with like these characters with giant teeth, and you would have to drag the dentist tool to clean their teeth or do stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, they look. They look at that, and then you look at Color Switch. You wouldn't know that the same person made both games, but that shift created Color Switch from what I was making prior. That little idea of oh, instead of making something based off of what I think is popular or a theme. How about something that could be around 40 years? Mm-hmm. Um, and, 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 and yeah, just that it's kind of, I think Tony Robbins gives the example of, you know, if you hit a golf ball and then you hit it in your, you hit it uh, like a centimeter to the left, that little centimeter will actually send it, you know, a huge distance to the left compared to where you hit it prior. Mm-hmm. So that little shift gets a giant result. Right. Right. Only obviously if you hit it, hit the ball hard, right? <laughs> you can hit it. Yeah. Don't miss the ball. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But interesting. So obviously once the shift happened, when you realize the okay, cam, I want a game that's 40 years from now, people are still playing. It kind of, Oh, even just logically thinking about it, you can exclude the dentistry part because it's unlikely. We've never heard of games uh, that stayed around 40 years, uh, anything to do with uh, dentistry. So yeah. you looked at the games that were around 40 years, like Pac-Man, for example. Yeah, Pac-Man, Uno. Um, those were the two main ones I analyzed. And I, you know, uh, so, you know, knowing your history in any industry is very important because you know, there's a reason why people know those games still. And I use these tools from a book called Thinker Toys, and they show you how to tear apart ideas to create new ideas. And I tore apart Pac-Man and Uno using a technique called slice and dice. And you basically just list all the attributes of the game you can think of. So Pac-Man, and that's why they call it slice and dice, because all the attributes are all these pieces of the game. Or the or or the idea of the concept, I should say, because I just specific, I just happen to use these techniques for games. But Pac Man, I, I said, okay, you got a maze, you got ghosts, you got like five colors, you have a dark background, you have Pac Man pellets, and uh, and I and then one thing I noticed was, oh, if, when you eat the giant Pac Man pellet, the ghosts change color. And then over at Uno, I sliced and diced it. And I noticed that, oh, you have a wild card that changes the top card to one of four colors that you choose. Mm-hmm. And I looked at Uno and I looked at Pac-Man and I saw a common, and these are both multi-billion dollar products. And I saw the common um, attribute between them was color switching, but it was a, it was not the main theme of the game. Like the point of Uno is to get rid of all your cards. The point of Pac-Man is to eat all the pellets. So you got eating and you got like just, you know, discarding card, all your cards. And, but I saw this mechanic that was in the game is a side mechanic, not the main mechanic. And I said, Ooh, they're both of these multi-billion dollar products have this color changing, but it's not the main thing. And I, I thought, Oh, I'll make it the main thing because there's, this has to be powerful. This is part of the, the design of these powerful products. This has to be powerful. And I repurposed it and used it as the main theme for my game. And prior to my game, I have not discovered another game that used color switching as the main mechanic um, the way that I did. And I, I would attribute that to one of the main reasons um, it became so popular. But, but really, it's like, you know, if someone breeds a racehorse, they get two uh, horses that that are 
the our resources are 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 of the caliber that you could create a that that resource. So it makes it, it it's the idea that you you go to powerful ideas, proven ideas, to then have the seed for a new powerful idea. So um, that's why I went to those games because I thought there's got to be something inherently powerful in these products, which is why they've been around for 40 years. So mm -hmm. I, I honed in on the color switching. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And we're going to talk a bit more about the game itself later, but first I want to circle back to the fact that well, 40 times you thought, okay, this is going to be it. This is going to be number one. Yeah. Now it's a span it, of two years. Two years. And I yeah. get the first three, maybe five times. You think this is going to be number one. Well, let's say the first 10 times. But to go for 40 iterations, why? How did you do it? And uh, why? Um... I, uh, I mean, and at the time I was like 80 grand debt and, uh, I was definitely in a pretty tough spot, but I guess my main motivation was, you know, we, and my family, my, what, what year was that? That was 2013. My mom had actually died four years prior and everyone in my family, we're all kind of like, it seemed like we were all stuck in something. And because we were stuck kind of just like always focused on trying to pay the bills that we had or, or, um, you know, whatever problems we had at the time, uh, everyone was kind of separated and stuck and, and almost was like trapped in something. And I, I kind of, I was like, I wanted to fix that, you know? So it wasn't, I didn't want to, my goal wasn't to make like a ton of money, but making money was to me, it's a tool. And so I look at it as a resource It's you know, there's a huge difference between something you want to, when you covet something and when you, when you know that, okay, this is a tool that will, that will help with X, Y, and Z. So that was my real motivation was how can I, how can I fix this situation to where, where we're all kind of like stuck and we're not, you know, we don't get to see each other and we're all kind of trapped in these scenarios and how can I fix that? And, uh, when I found games, I realized, Hey, this is cause I had read a book called, um, uh, rich dad, poor dad. And he talks about, he talks about creating passive income. So as soon as I got, I found out about making games from my roommate, I said, Oh, that's what he's talking about. If I can make one of these games that would do really well, that'd be passive income and the passive income. Cause you have this, this mechanism, this machine that's doing the work for you. Then that, that, um, gives you your time to use for other things you'd like to use it for. And so my motivation was really just how can I help my family out and um, just get everyone out of these kind of trapped scenarios. And, uh, and so every time I would fail, I would just have that in the back of my mind. Plus I had a great quote by Michael Jordan. I think it was one of, in one of his Air Jordan commercials, but he said he failed over and over and over again in his career. And that's the only reason he succeeded. So every time I would fail, I had this quote, actually, I wrote it on the, the mirror. And I said, I said, I, as bad as I would feel, I'm like, well, you know, if Michael Jordan's saying this, he's, he must be on to something because I think he did pretty well in his, in his area of life with, with his uh, career. So I, I would always be like, all right, well, I guess I'll keep going and fail again. And so it was kind of these different motivations like, the family kind of motivation and then the inspirational motivation. Here's this, this mythical figure that every, you know, you've known ever since you were a kid who's saying I failed a ton. When I, whenever I thought of Jordan, I never thought of him as a failure or someone who failed, but really to get to where he was, he had to, it's just part of the process. You know, you have to be bad before you can be good and you have to be willing to, to be bad until you, become good by iteration and improving your thinking on something. So that was really the, I had that motivational, inspirational motivation. And then the, the, the family motivation as far as uh, helping everyone out. Plus my, my own personal, how do I get out of this, <laughs> this uh, situation to where I didn't have a marketable skill at the time. 
Uh, and I was just stuck in all this debt where I had like credit card companies call me every day. And I would just, I would just ignore the calls because I thought, well, I can, I need to pay the rent, but I can always pay those credit cards later. And so it was just this, this, uh, very tough situation, but, um, somehow I got out of it, but I would say those were the main motivations. Mm. Interesting. Of course, if we think about Jordan, I mean, many of us think about all the last second game winner shots that he made. But if we think about how many did he actually take and how many did he fail, and most of them, obviously, he didn't win the game. But we remember, we seem to remember these, you know, these moments when, okay, well, you know, won the game, amazing. Circling back, though, to it took you 41 iteration to get there. Yeah. Now, you talk about your motivation, what drove you to do it. What did the people around you say? Did you have a lot of support? Were they saying, yeah, you're on the right track? Or did people say, hey, listen, maybe maybe 40 times is enough. Like, what are you doing here? Clearly, you don't have what it takes. Yeah, some... Uh, not many people understand the world of apps in games. It's a very far off thing like and so a lot of people will just because they only go by what they know they're like wait why doesn't he just get a job full-time job you know doing this or that and stop working on this pipe dream i think that's what most people think and and uh you know there's different there's different scenarios where you have that but i think oftentimes the main point is when you do something out of the norm People, I think they they have good intentions. Your family and friends and all that they want to see you succeed. They they don't want to see you following a pipe in their mind a pipe dream that's going to end up having you on the streets because you can't pay the bills because you want to be the artist or whatever. And and uh, so most people, I would say, they're going by because they're going by what they know and 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 what they know is, uh, hey, you go put in your forty hours a week, you pay the bills. Um, this crazy thing you're doing, um, maybe you shouldn't do that. Maybe you should do this. And I had people say that I had people just say like, um, you know, David's wasting his time games. I had some people say games don't even make any money. You know, uh, and, he, and he's not going to make a, 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 a game that's going to do well. And why isn't, why isn't David come back to town and get a job? You know, there were all these things. You have some people who will be, um, they'll say something supportive, but the tone or the kind of subtext is they're, you know, they're not really being, they're just kind of like, you know, saying it, but without the actual intention. And then there's some people who are, but I think most of the time when you're doing something out of the norm with good intentions, people want to see you do well. They want to discourage you from doing that. And get back to where they see that, you know, that you would be successful. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of something to where I think you just have to let it go in one ear and out the other and continue to what you're doing. Because I think there are a lot of people who get discouraged because of something their friends and family say, and then they stop pursuing something because they may, you know, I should get back to reality like they're saying and, and do this. I think that happens a lot, actually. Mm -hmm. So, so not to say it's everybody, but I think you know, life is about conforming to groups. And if you don't conform to the group, the group will, will influence you to conform to the group or they'll reject you. And so in this case, you know, your friends and family want you to conform to how they view things and do things. And they're really in their mind doing it for your benefit and they want to see you succeed. And, and, uh, that's kind of how that works when people don't understand something at all. And it's funny because people have a lot of opinions about something like, especially games don't make any money. Are you kidding me? You, you, you know, you don't like, you know, nothing about the game industry. Uh, most people don't, but how could you think that games don't make any money? Uh, it's just funny how people have such strong opinions about something they don't know anything about, you know? Uh, like I, I don't understand anything about poker other. I know the main mechanics of how you play and everything, but I, I, I do my best not to assume things about it. 
um, one way or the other because I just don't know. Like I could learn from you, I could learn from doing a bunch of research, but um, to just have that strong opinion just because mm-hmm. uh, is uh, is uh, an interesting phenomenon. So that's what I would say. It's kind of it was kind of a mainly people kind of discouraging you, but when it's something they don't understand because it's not it's scary when you don't understand something and it's it really it's a lot of work and scary to embark on something because i would get depressed all the time because i wasn't getting the success or any any kind of it didn't seem like i was making any progress and so it was you know it's not like i made 40 games and i was just motivated the whole time i was motivated but i was also i just it was a roller coaster ride of depression make the next game that's going to be the hit doesn't hit depression And, uh, you know, when people go through emotions like that, some people can only take so much and they, they go back to, you know, what maybe their friends or family are saying. And so it's, Mm -hmm. uh, it is, it's hard and it's not for everybody. Not everyone wants to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. And I think so many people from the poker world can relate to the experience that you're describing here, you know, where we're, you know, most of the poker players, well, nowadays, you know, Poker is easier to explain because there there are a lot of examples of hey look at this he's a public figure wrote some books made a you know hundreds of millions of dollars or tens of millions of dollars yeah. you know so there are examples of sort of reputable people who you can look up to and say hey you know what this is a legit industry etc. When I think back yeah. some ten years ago and even though it's still present right now I know of a lot of people who are starting out in poker they're in their twenties. Um, they're trying to explain it to their families, to their friends, and nobody seems to understand. They're yeah. all like with a blank stare of like, well, okay, yeah, yeah, we support you. I mean, and then uh, every six months, like, so are you looking for a job? Are you getting getting into, you know, a normal life, a normal profession? Uh-huh. And of course, you know, with poker... Part of the game is variance, is is the is luck. Yeah. So yeah. you can be a good player. And let's face it, when you're starting out, you're unlikely to be a good player. Much like when yeah. you created your own game, even though in your mind you're creating a bestseller, it was very unlikely that you knew anything really. Yeah. Right. And it's the yeah. same in poker. Now put in a lot of hard work put in a lot of sweat and tears, you're getting somewhere. But in poker, obviously, still the variance of, you know, the bad run of cards, coupled with probably a few bad decisions, because you're not um, not on the level yet. You know, you might make bad decisions in terms of bankroll management, bad decisions in terms of game selection. And a lot of people yeah. kind of get ruined, you know, and their career is over. Some people persist, some people drop off. In your case, 40 times there's a failure. Luckily, the 40, 41st one was the success. I don't know if we would be talking right now if it took you 120 times, you know. Do you get to the 120th, I don't know. right? Because like when when is enough enough, right? That's that's interesting. To yeah, me, well, yeah, when you realize maybe I don't have the skill for this. Yeah, yeah maybe I'm a bit delusional. Right? And by the way, that's only the published games. I have another 100 games on my computer that sometimes you spent, like here was one game I spent a hundred hours on, never published it. Uh, some of these games you spend a week on, some you spend three months on. Um, but, but oftentimes I wouldn't even, there's more games I never published. Some of them are, are kind of beginnings of games. Some, some were like really, you know, full, full games. And so there were a lot more I never even published. And that those are just the ones I, I actually finished through. Um, for whatever reason, uh, but uh, but yeah, at what point exactly? What point do you think? Huh? Maybe there's nothing there. For, maybe I just don't have what is the secret juice that is required for this thing. Um, and but if I had thought that there was uh, the 40th game and the next one, color switch, there was a year between those two. So if I gave up anywhere in that year. I never would have known that the next one would be it. And I think that's a key idea is that you never, you don't know how long something's going to take, but if you give yourself a time limit, you may 
miss out on the actual window that opens past mm-hmm. that time limit because you, you don't know when things are going to happen. And when you think when you, you were just talking about, you know, being lucky or it's kind of like um, the more opportunities you give yourself, the more you experience something, it's statistics. They, you know, <clears throat> when something finally happens to someone, they're like, oh, they got lucky. Well, maybe that, maybe that was a 10, uh, the 10, I'm trying to say it, the word right, thousandth time that they experienced that. And so every, every time up to that, they got a little better. They understood it in w- which way or what. And so when you see someone like, let's say win $5 million at poker, I'm like, man, must, must be nice to be so lucky. But had they been playing for five years before that, it took them five years to get to that moment for everything to kind of line up. And that's what people don't see. They don't see the daily effort and the work and the study that you're putting in. And really it's statistics. You have to show up. I think Wayne Gretzky said, you'll miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. So you have to take a lot of shots. You have to give yourself a lot of exposure. You have to play tons of, of these games before boom, one hits and, and you only need one success, but you have to have a ton of failures before that, where things don't work out. Well, granted, if you learn from your failures, right? Because there's nothing yes. worse than just fail for 40 times and 150 times and 200 times yeah. without action. So you basically, if you do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result, uh, you're yeah. probably crazy, as, as was the yeah. Einstein's uh, quote, right? Yeah. And that's the missing piece. The missing piece is not learning. In other words, not putting new information in your head that can create new actions and therefore create new results. That's the secret. It seems so, it's, it's deceptively simple, but very, very important. And, and that's the key is when you put that new information in your head, could be a conversation, could be going on a trip somewhere new, could be studying a book, could be uh, watching an interview of a top player, could be reading a biography. There's infinite amount of data to put in your head and you don't know which piece you're going to need. Like when I found the book Thinker Toys, I didn't know five years later that would be key to designing my hit game. But without that book, I wouldn't have known to slice and dice Pac-Man and Uno. Mm -hmm. I would, I would just look at them like everybody else. Every, I've never heard of anybody saying, Oh yeah, Pac-Man or Uno inspired this game because I tore it apart and saw all the pieces and decided this one. Never in all the decades that, it, that those games have been out, have I ever heard an interview where someone said that. Everyone who looks at Pac-Man sees it as Pac-Man. Everyone who looks at a chair sees it as a chair or a door as a door. As a door as a, but, but really, it's like if you, if you – and that's the, the key to those techniques. They teach you how to look at things in different ways, whether you, you broaden your perspective and look at it from a very high position, or if you zoom in on one specific attribute of whatever it is you're studying, it's all about changing your perspective and looking at things in ways that most people, um, uh, you know, opposite of how most people look at things. You know, someone looks like I'm looking at a chair right now and someone looks at a chair and they just see something to sit on. Whereas someone else could say, how, you know what, that chair, if I added some hover technology and some GPS voice Mm -hmm. activation coordinates, I could have that chair. I could tell it to hover over to my friend and then, and then they would hover back over to the table and they wouldn't even have to get up. Or what if it's a smart chair? What if it's a chair made of chocolate and I could have little chairs uh, that people can buy and, and eat as candy or something. I mean, there's so many ways to look at something. And that's the byproduct of using techniques like that. When you, when you sit there and slice and dice and use all these techniques, after a while, you do it naturally. You don't have to do, okay, step one, what's my challenge? Step two, how do I break it up into all these pieces? Step three, how do I take a piece and manipulate it into something new? You just do it. And, and, and everyone has this ability. It's just we're so used to looking at – we're in school, A plus B equals C. Learn this. We've already thought about it for you. Learn this and go use it like that. No one's taught to think for themselves in general. They're just mm-hmm. taught, hey, here's the information we've already thought out for you. Here's the formulas. Go get, now go teach this. 
And, um, and so, so yeah, that's, uh, I think I, I went on a number of tangents and I, mm. I completely forgot my main point, but there you go. But the tangents are interesting though, you know, especially the thing that you, you were, uh, telling about that it's important when these things, or well, it's a great point where these things start coming naturally to you when you're not just following a formula, when, you know, dissecting yeah. a game, for example, just happens naturally. And it brought to my mind. Um, an example of a friend of mine, a very good friend of mine, who every time he visits me in Malta, I'm always surprised by just how business-minded he is. I remember for me, the, the very surprising thing, we, we, we went to uh, the beach with the families and with the kids. So we're sitting on the beach and there's this ice cream tra- truck that sells cold beverage and ice cream, right? Yeah. To me, I see an ice cream truck and I think like, I don't want ice cream right now, I'm good. That's where my thoughts of that truck end. He was yeah. sitting, looking at it for like 15 minutes, observing the, the amounts of people going in and out. He's telling me, listen, this is an amazing business. You know, look how much money he's making that costs him nothing. So everything he looks at, he sees business. I mean, he, he's running a, a proper big company. To him, an ice cream truck that shouldn't be part of the equation. I mean, it's too small to be interesting, but he yeah. sees these opportunities everywhere. And it just goes to show like, you know, like you said, somebody's going to look, be looking at that chair and sees a chair. Somebody might be getting some ideas about, okay, what, am I, what can I produce here? You know, how can I sell it? How can I market it? And people are just looking at things so differently and when something comes naturally to you that's that's when that sweet spot is when you can just focus on actually creating or doing what you what you're supposed to be doing people who yeah. try to sort of f- follow the formula of okay creating business point one write the goal or whatever and then okay next step let's let's do this that that yeah interesting interesting I want to ask you about, so this huge transition, right? This huge turning point, or at least on the surface, you know, the, the turning point that we can put the finger to is, is that mm-hmm. switch for you to understand that, hey, which game people would play still 40 years from now? Where did, did, I, where did this idea come to you? Where well, did it come I think from? I was actually... I think I was actually looking because whenever I design games, I I open up the book Thinker Toys and I, I, uh, you know, I always use those techniques. But I think I was, um, I think I just honed in on how you said you need to be specific with your challenge that you're going to try to solve or that you're solving the problem of whatever that he said. You have to be. He has a whole section where he talks about the importance of being specific. Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized, oh, I don't think I'm being specific enough. So what would my specific challenge be? What am I trying to do? I thought, well, I'm trying to make a game that's popular, but I'm trying to make a game that that is designed so well that there's something about it that's so iconic that it's going to be around in 40 years. So I said that was my challenge I wrote down. I would like to make a game that will be around in 40 years, whereas before I was just, oh, I want to make a hit game. Well, that's pretty broad. What what kind of game, this and that. So even that challenge, though, I said, okay, I know I also noticed that a lot of the big game known games are very simple. Angry Birds, you just stretch and launch a bird. You just stretch and launch a bird. There's there's not much more to it. Pac-Man, you're eating a bunch of dots. There's always it's a very clear goal, very clear way to get to the goal, very clear visuals, um, very very simple mechanics and how to operate um, the game. So that's really what it came down to is I, I honed in on, I saw the importance of what he was saying and I was like, I haven't been being specific enough. I need to be more specific. So I, I just honed in on a much more specific challenge statement. What am I trying to actually do here specifically? And in anything in life, when you get very, very specific with your intentions, you get very, very specific results. Right, right. Well, let's talk about people playing games. Mm -hmm. Because obviously you thought about 
well, you dissected some of the most iconic games and, and you have an incredibly popular game, quite addictive, I suppose, because you know people seem to, to love it. And I, I haven't played it myself, but I've seen a couple of videos um, of it. And for a split second there, I was thinking like, oh, I really want to download it. And I mm-hmm. refrain from it because I make a point of not having any applications on my phone apart from everything that I need for messaging and just keeping it yeah. minimalistic because I know what kind of a time pit all of these things are. Right? So yeah. I'm trying to steer away because I know that, you know, give me like that game, game called Time Pit. <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's a, <laughs> that's, that's a fun sounding game. name for a game. Time that's a pit. great idea. At least that's a game which is just basically you know, straightforward with what it is going to be for, right? Yeah. But um, yeah, so to me, you know, I see a game like this and I, I know it, it's just getting like, I'm going to lose at least a week, couple of weeks of my life before I catch myself on a thought, like, what am I doing? I have things to do. Let's let's delete it. It's one of those what games for sure. Yeah. Right. And, and it's, and it's cool because, I mean, we need... We need those things, right? We need to switch off. We need to switch off from from the day to day, from the routine, you know. And what better way is there than to switch off to a game, which, you know, yeah. especially like to me, anything that makes you focus your mind on something, so kind of nothing else exists. Because I mean, playing your game, it takes so much focus. You're yeah. unlikely to be thinking about, you know, your your groceries, your whatever happened yesterday. What do you, you need could, to do tomorrow? But then you'll die. Yeah. <laughs> well, 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 yeah. But at least yeah, for that I, moment, then that moment, yeah. well, you know, it's, it's beautiful. So people need this. Why do people play games, especially the mobile phone games? Let's let's zoom in on the mobile phone games because obviously people play games for so many reasons. We can talk that it's been forever, etc., yeah. etc. Et but mobile phone, new phenomenon. We we spend more and more. Well, relatively new phenomenon. For some of my users, they're, they're, they're going to be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Mobile phones have been, been here forever, right? But you know, I'm still of a generation where we had to sort of dial the phone with the, you know, the, the old yep. school type of thing. But mobile phone, people spend more and more time on it. What kind of games are people looking for? And what works? Uh, so, yeah, there's different motivations for games. I mean, a game, if you think about what a game is, it doesn't matter if it's a physical sport or poker or a mobile app. I like, I like Jesse Shell's um, definition. A game is a fun problem-solving experience. There's always a problem to solve. Now, there's probably some quote unquote artist out there who will uh, say, ha ha, I have a game with no goal. But typically most games are about problem solving in a fun way. And um, so, so mobile games, um, first of all, that's the biggest audience there is the non gamer someone who probably doesn't have an Xbox or a PlayStation or a Nintendo. And they they just do it more for leisure, like, you know, I'm on my way to work. I got five minutes to kill. Okay, I'm going to play this quick, simple game. Um, uh, oh, I am, uh, uh, I got a break in school. I got a break. Um, I'm on lunch break. I need something to do. And so it's quick time killer. So, you know, you you're in, as far as the problem I'm solving, because every product out there has to solve a problem for somebody um, in a, in a, in a good way, a game solves a problem oftentimes of the non gamer of boredom. You know, I'm, I got five minutes to kill. I, you know, I'd like something to do and what, you know, what constitutes a mobile game that will do that. It has to be simple in a variety of ways. Visually, I have to understand what, even though, even though the player isn't thinking these things intentionally or, or consciously, this is what's going on in the subconscious. If I understand what this is about, I'm going to download it. If it looks like something I could actually play and, and I don't have to have some crazy skill, I'm going to download it. So usually the visuals are very minimalistic. A lot of times they're, they're high contrast. You know, there's these colors that kind of just like pop from the background. Um, 
the mechanics of actually, because uh, there's a lot of things that are, any moving part in a game is a mechanic, but the mechanic of that you use to actually interact with the game as a player is oftentimes very, very simple. So simple, like in my game, you just touch the screen, tap, tap, tap. And that is something we called, um, it's, the, it's the game design concept of uh, primal, something that's primal. Um, something that requires no tools, like touching something or looking at something or smelling something, it's primal. Um, a t- that's, I think that's why Steve Jobs didn't like the stylus because it was a tool that got in the way between the iPhone and you. Your finger is a natural stylus. And so uh, iPhone is primal. And so therefore, I, I also made Color Switch primal where you just touch it. You don't have to do anything crazy. You don't have to do like a, you know, swipe this way and that way and this and touch and make a half circle and then you can play the game. So oftentimes games are, you can instantly play it. You instantly understand it. You can instantly open it kind of like a candy bar. You can just, why, why, you know, people like candy bars because they're full of sugar. They're, they smell good. They have a good texture when you chew on them. You can, boom, you can open in the wrapper real quick. The colors stand out. Uh, video games are very similar in the mobile sphere. The colors attract you, the sights, the sounds. Um, but everything about it is very simple, very visual, um, very minimalistic because most people can, can are interested in something that's minimal, minimalistic as opposed to, oh, this game has a bunch of pink colors and it's about Barbie dolls. Well, I don't think I want to play that so much as opposed to, oh, then that this, the person who is into that game, maybe they're not, they're not into the Call of Duty game with the weapons and everything. But both of those players could be into a minimalistic game with just shapes, uh, very simple geometric shapes. And so oftentimes when you look on the App Store, you see these very, very simple games that are simple in the theme, simple in how you interact with them. They're not too hard. They're not too easy. They have a nice challenge to them. Um, you can, you could play the game for 30 seconds. You could play it for a minute. You could just have these quick sessions. So a game that gets you in there right away, doesn't have a ton of tutorials to watch and, and things to like, you know, you know, uh, to, to do before you actually play the game, they're instant, just like a candy bar, boom, rip it open, boom, I'm eating it. So a lot of games on the app store are kind of like candy bars in a way where, where, um, and you'll see them kind of fighting for the charts. This this is the new flavor of the week. That goes away. That's the new flavor of the week. And then there's some games that kind of stay there, like Color Switch. You know, it, uh, has been around for four years. And games that came out around that time, they're not anywhere anymore. But you do have some games that will just stay around, and some games that kind of like they market it. And once you know, and that's all based on testing. And then it just stays there. And when it doesn't make any money more, they don't market it anymore, and they pop up the new game. Um, so those are kind of like the broad strokes, I guess, of the general ideas of what, what constitutes a game that does well on the mobile app stores. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that part, which you mentioned that it should be so easy that you can play 30 seconds, 60 seconds if you want to, Yeah, you know, it's just fill in that little moment, which, which becomes that thing that you get back to over and over again, whenever you have that moment. What other things make people get back to the game? Well, one is called the flow state. And the flow state is this magical mental state that you get in when you play a game where when I play the game, <clears throat> the challenge of the game pulls me in. Again, it, if it feels too challenging, like if I feel I can't get good at this game or it's going to take too much work, I don't want to play it. If the game is too easy, I also don't want to play it. If the game is challenging enough and it incrementally increases the challenge and kind of like tugs you along, that's the magical place that you want a player to be in, which is called the flow state, where I just get lost in the game because I'm feeling the challenge of it, but I can also feel I'm getting a little better. And it's a tug and pull kind of um, situation. So it's this gradual incline. Uh, of difficulty and challenge and also at the same time feeling like my skill level is going up and that's the flow state. So the flow state is one. 
um, uh, the the uh, the theme is another. You know, there are some themes that are great, but there some themes are so powerful they resonate deep inside you, and those are resonant themes, like the theme of love or family or friends. These are all these all res these could all be resonant themes. So if a theme really resonates with someone, then that can also be a reason why they're gonna come back to that game over and over, as opposed to the game that doesn't have a resonant theme and therefore has nothing kind of inside it to give it any kind of depth. You know, it's just a very superficial uh, experience. Um, I mean, there's a lot of game design concepts, but another key one I would say is, um, let's see, flow state. And, the, and again, the flow state is, there's, there's four aspects to it. There's your, you have to have clear goals, no distractions. So in my game, I have a dark background. There's no distractions. There's just, here's the obstacle. Here's the star inside, get in there and then get to the next one. Clear goals, no distractions, continuously challenging. And, um, the fourth one is escaping me at the moment, but, um, so there's four pieces to the flow state and these are all gone over. And if anyone is actually interested in Go, just like studying this, you get Jesse Shell's book, The Art of Game Design. He has it all in there. Um, but uh, but simplicity in a lot of ways, and and so, you know, in is gonna is gonna um, be in all these these games that that people enjoy. Um, colors, you know, you have to have you have to have a, a, a basic understanding of color theory because if you're using colors that Clat like the 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 foreground clashes with the background visually. I'm I'm just going to be put off by that, and so um, you have to have a, you know a, a decent understanding of uh, of color theory so that you can make sure that all the colors work well together. There's a there's good contrast. Um, oh, and that's the fun that's the fun um, uh, uh, insight into me is I'm actually colorblind, so I have to really study color theory so that I know, you know, uh, how to use colors since I kind of get them mixed up all the time. Um, interesting. Yeah. But, uh, what else, what are some other key game design? And actually if I, uh, if I, there's an app, Jesse has a, um, a game design. Oh, do I not have it? Uh, a game design app that's a version um, of his uh, book. Yeah, there it is. I didn't have it downloaded for some reason. Um, so yeah, in his book, there's these things he calls lenses, which each lens is a game design tool or concept. So, oh, surprise. So if you can surprise people, that's something that will draw them in. So actually, one of the main inspirations for Color Switch was uh, actually derived from my experience as a magician. Um, I, I understood how powerful the moment of surprise is. So I thought, you know, if I could, if I could recreate that powerful moment of surprise, which in a magic effect that someone feels and apply that to a game, I bet I could create something powerful. And so that's where I thought, Hey, what if something about my character is always changing? And eventually when I picked color switching, it was the idea that, oh, the, the ball changes colors right before it has to go through an obstacle. And then you have to instantly kind of kind of react to that new color that you're that you just changed into. So so surprise is a, is a very important one. And then um, like looking on this, another another good, really good one. And so on this app, there's like tons of game design concepts. It's kind of like, you know, a cook and who's in the, you know, making a dish. They have available to them, like, let's say 200 spices in their kitchen, but their dish only requires three of them. So there's a ton of these concepts, but you don't need every single one of them to, you know, to focus on to actually design a game. So I, I focused on surprise, um, emotion, uh, resonant theme and, um, oh, unification and uh, flow state. The last one I'll go over is unification. 
Um, if you can take your theme and unify it everywhere, the whole game feels whole. And so in Color Switch, for example, I use the colors in the game in my title so that the two O's in color are not only the, the four colors of the game, but they're actually one of the obstacles, the main obstacle, which is a circle made up of four colors. So I unified the theme in my title and also my icon. My icon is the main obstacle in the game, a circle with the ball jumping up in the middle. So my icon is also using unification in, in that you know, I'm unifying and even on the main menu, all the, all the buttons on the menu, they turn in circles like the obstacles turn in circles in the game. So I unified the menu, the icon, the title, um, so that everything feel felt whole. And so when everything feels whole, it, it has this effect on people uh, as well. And so those are, you know, those are some um, of the, uh, what I consider the most important concepts Flow state being one of the most important because, again, if the challenge isn't there in the right amount and at the right temperature, then, you know, it's kind of like getting into a hot bath. I can't get into a hot bath if it's going to give me third degree burns. And if it's too cold, I can't get in because I'm going to I'm going to be shivering. So it's got to be right at that perfect temperature. And so the same thing goes with the game as far as the challenge. Right. <clears throat> right. And another aspect to the challenge, I just wonder how important is, um, well, let me describe the situation. Right? I don't want to put a label on it because I don't even know what word I'm looking for. But you know, if I'm thinking about, for example, poker or pretty much any other game which has a skill element to it, which is pretty much almost every game because over time, you know, the levels get more and more difficult. So you feel that you you are becoming better um, at it. So we develop some sort of sunk cost feeling that, hey, I invested so much time into this game. I achieved a specific level. So for me to switch a game, to do something else feels bad, right? Because I invested so much time into it. Is that a big part of design of the game when you're designing a game do you think about that aspect of you know retaining people with so that switching feels slightly slightly bad for them or was it not part of a consideration maybe it's just a side product yeah i don't yeah for me i guess that's more of a side product because my main focus is uh especially for color switch when we first launched it it was one game and that's it the main game and as updates um, happened. We added characters and game modes and different color palettes that you could use and different like effects you could put on your character. And really it's, it's the idea of people will become bored with the experience unless you keep on adding on to the experience. And it's the same for a product like why doesn't Coca-Cola just sell Coca-Cola? Because people have already experienced that flavor. So they, they Coke, here's Diet Coke, here's Raspberry Coke, here's Chocolate Coke, whatever it is. Or, hey, Coke is happiness. And they have to kind of like, re- they're giving you a different mental experience as far as like, oh, this isn't just a, a drink that rots my teeth. This is happiness. And so they have to, you know, so... So it's the idea of updates, updates for a product, um, add on to the current experience so that, that people come, keep coming back to, um, to experience the new content. So for me, it's, uh, it's always doing the same thing where we keep on coming out with new content. So we have people wanting to keep coming back because it was just any game. If, if angry birds or, or candy crush, candy crush, has thousands and thousands of levels, whereas when they first began, they might have had a couple hundred levels, and and so you know they've they've been able to have a top grossing game for I don't know that game's been out for like five or six years something. It's kind of like the equivalent of having a um, box office number one hit in the theater stay stay in in the top. Uh, uh, stay, be, keep being the number one movie for weekend after weekend after weekend and for year after year after year. 
that's unique to video games. And so, um, so yeah, it's, for me, it's kind of a byproduct. There are companies that, that I'm sure have that mentality, like, okay, we need to make sure they don't go to these other games by doing this. But I guess my way of thinking that that is just as simple as, okay, what can I add to this as far as an update so that people will keep playing? And uh, even for the new game that we that we're gonna about to start marketing, it we launched we've launched it in a very simple form. There's only like two characters that you could unlock, but we're gonna be adding so much to it to add on to the experience. And every product is like that. You you're always uh, updating in some way, whether it's a it's a a company that produces drinks or a food item or a movie or um, a toy line, there's always updates. And that's kind of, um, I, I think, how I would think of it. Because mm-hmm. I'm, I'm thinking back to the poker scene. And from one perspective, there's like two groups tugging, in, in a tugging war, basically. Because, you know, the, the, the poker players themselves me included we're quite resistant to change you know we we're used to the game that we're playing don't want it to change much invested a lot of time into studying it into understanding it on a deeper level so whenever some changes come in you feel like well you know what what did i waste 10 years of my life studying this game now i have to switch uh, all over you know many people are not willing to switch games not willing to investigate new games you know and obviously the, the ones that are usually are the ones that are the more successful you know the, the more right. open-minded poker players tend to you know if they manage to achieve excellence at different variations of the game you know they tend to get more success but at the same time if the game doesn't evolve if the sites don't keep introducing new variations don't make it easier for people to join in we're running out of new players right because tapping yeah. into new markets say the mobile phone applications whenever the first time when the poker sites introduced the the opportunity for for players to play from their mobile phone it was one of the best things that happened to poker because all right. of a sudden all these people who are well for professional poker players that's amazing because all these people who are completely distracted they just have like 5 minutes free free time while having a conversation with somebody they try to play poker uh, obviously they're not going to succeed because well they don't even pay attention to it that much right so these things the new new ways of engaging people the new new, new forms the new ways they are so important and there's more and more innovation nowadays in the poker sites Yet so mm-hmm. much resistance from from the players themselves because we don't want. Well, I say we. I actually want things to change because I I I would like the market to expand, and I feel like if I have to start learning a new game from scratch, it's fine. I'm yeah. gonna go for it. You know, if we're all starting from scratch, I feel like, well, I I'm I'm gonna get to the top quicker than you know the the majority. So. Game on, let's go. But yeah. a lot of people don't think that way. So I'm curious to see common, what's going to happen. Yeah, I think that's common with a lot of things, uh, whether it's a game or some other industry. People, There's people who adapt to the change, and that's all life is about, is you have to adapt to, to um, excel, to keep excelling. Um, and then those who don't just kind of get stuck in, in the way things used to be and really things are always changing. It's like, uh, there's a documentary that I, is one of my favorites called the King of Kong, Don, uh, King of Kong, a fistful of quarters. And there are some, it's about classic arcade players. And a lot of those guys actually just, they only play classic arcade. They're like, yeah, I didn't like it when the street fighter games came out and they're just too violent. And I like the simplicity and this and that. And so they're kind of, um, they're stuck in that era and that era is gone now. And so if you want to be a competitive player, then you have to, you have to uh, adapt and learn the new, the new current um, games that are coming out and whatnot. Um, But yeah, I think, I think there's always a percentage of people who are, 
up for the change and the challenge. And there's a percentage that are always just kind of like, nope, this is the way I like things. And they're more stubborn. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I think there's no way around it. It's just, there's, there's always these different personalities. I actually want to ask you a couple of personal questions. Try to understand a bit more about yourself because I was really surprised that your your schedule is basically you, you're waking up 4 a.m. every day. Yeah, that's quite unusual. In uh, you know, f- for the most part, what's the motivation behind it, and how how long have you been doing it for? Um, no, I'm not going to pretend like every day, uh, you know, is 4 a.m. But um, cause there, there's days where you stay up late for whatever reason you got friends over. It's like midnight. There's no way I'm waking up at 4am, yeah. but typically yes. Um, four or 5am. And, uh, I think I, the, maybe ever since I read this book on time management a long time ago, and he said in the book, the most productive people usually wake up at 5am. Mm-hmm. And it's the idea that when you're up at that hour and no one else is, you're able to get a lot of work done, you know, for one thing. And, um, and I guess it's just, a, it's a time of day, for, especially for me where when I wake up, I'm ready to be up. I'm happy to be up. Um, as long as I've got enough sleep and I just start working on stuff. Cause I, I guess it's like a, 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 when you do a clean reboot on your computer, it's like, okay, I got my reboot ready to go. Whereas late at night, I just want to go to sleep. I'm getting tired and I just don't want to work on anything. So it's a completely different mindset for me. And, um, but really it's the idea that there's no distractions at that time and everything's quiet around, you know, the house and outside. And, uh, it's, for me, it's just, uh, um, a time where I can think clearly and work on things. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I would say I, I read that book a long time ago, so I guess it's been going on. I mean, it's definitely ever since I got in the game. So 2013, um, I think even before then, well, you know, I, I remember one thing I really liked doing at, at, at that hour um, that I started in 2011 was, uh, you ever heard of Toastmasters? No. What is it? It's an international public speaking organization. You basically show up to these meetings and they probably have some in your town. They got them all over, but you, you show up. You join a, a cl- local club and you work on your public speaking skills in a variety of ways. You can, you can write speeches however you like. To me, it's really fun. I've, I've even done a, a variety of impromptu speeches where someone doesn't show up and they were supposed to do a speech. Hey, guys, this person didn't show up. But does anyone want to do an impromptu? I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. So I've done those too. And so it's a really good skill. It's really fun. But there was a uh, group that met at 5.30 a.m. And so I would always go to that group because, you know, I'm already getting it up at that hour. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, it's just a, it's, it's kind of, it just feels like, uh, you're, you're getting, it's, a, I think it's a good way to, to drive you the rest of the day, knowing that you already started off working at a very early hour and you feel good about yourself because you've been utilizing your time well. So I think it's good for your mentality for the, the rest of the day. Mm-hmm. So kind of, I guess those are the main kind of reasons why. And, uh, you know, I guess that's kind of been going on since, uh, since around 2011. Although when I was in the military, cause I used to be a medic in the army, you, we had our physical training at by six o'clock, 6 a.m., I think, 5.30 or 6. So you'd always, so I had to get up for several years really early for that as well. So maybe it's maybe it started in the military. Maybe it was a military mm-hmm. thing. Oh, interesting. And we're going to get back to the military because I want to talk a bit about that history as well. Um, but so you wake up super early. How does your day look like? Um, You know, I'm not, I'm not like, a schedule type person. I don't like have every um, minute scheduled out. It's more if I get up, I'll make coffee. Um, I will. I like to look at the news. I like to see what's going on in the news. So I'll check a variety of news. And then um, uh, I'll oftentimes pick a couple of books I'm up that I've been reading. Um, 
or, um, you know, I'll see what's eventually I'll see what's going on with, um, with, uh, you know, the games working on new game designs to, cause now I have a, when I first made that game, I did it on my own with software called Buildbox, And then, you know, when you finally have a income coming in, then you can hire programmers and artists and everything. So, so, so the morning will evolve into, you know, looking, designing, um, uh, new games. Uh, usually right now it's under the main color switch brand designing new games under that brand. And then, uh, checking with my team, seeing what's, you know, what we're, what's currently going on with updates. And, um, since we're going to be marketing this game soon, you know, we're, we're doing marketing tests on a small scale to make sure we fine tune all that before we do the, the main marketing. And, uh, I would say that's kind of like the, the general kind of broad strokes of, of, I guess, a typical morning. How do you feel about now having a team, having to work with the team? Because originally when you went into the field of creating the games, it's just this yeah. pure creation, trying to iterate over different projects, trying to find that thing. So learning throughout the process. Once you reach that, when, when the success happened, now there's a bigger team, there's more people, there's things you need to coordinate, there's more administrative stuff, there's you know all those things. How was that transition for you? Um, it was pretty natural because even when I was making stuff on my own, I was working with an artist who is uh, in my company now. So he was an artist for my very first game. And so you right at the beginning, because there's, there's a variety of skills that you just don't have. And so I always focused on game design, which to me is the art, mainly the artistic side of things, uh, you know, uh, uh, I didn't focus on technical things. Like I wasn't trying to become a very highly technical proficient artist or a programmer. So very early on, I had to work as a creative director, learn how to articulate the ideas I had in my head in a way so that the artist could make the artwork the way I needed or the programmer could make the programming the way I needed it to be. And mo what happens most of the time is when something is made, it's not made quite how you need it. So you have to be, you, have, you learn to be specific right off the bat and then go from there and get even more specific and more specific because um, if you're not specific enough, they, they're not going to know what to make for the, the project that you're working on. So yeah, very early on, I was just used to working with teams on a small scale and it just kind of never really changed. It's just, you know, it gets, gets, it's, it's kind of like, I think Steven Spielberg said the same thing about filmmaking. He said, make a project on your camcorder at home. You know, it's the same thing as making a movie. All the same stuff happens. It's just, you know, it gets bigger. Mm. So, um, so yeah, I have always had to do the same thing as in, in other words, be a creative director. And, and I've just gotten, um, I have worked on improving my ability to articulate ideas in a more specific, clear way. And that comes with sketches, references of other games or other media that's out there. Um, and even my favorite thing to do is, is take a visual and record audio notes as I'm doing something on the computer, showing one of my guys something. Mm -hmm. And that is usually the clearest way for me to, to um, get an idea across is either you hear me and I'm recording the computer screen showing something or I'll record me sketching something and I'll be talking my way through the sketch in, in showing something with how I'm, how I'm uh, interacting with the, the pen and paper. Um, so that's, that's uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I've always done. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, there are so many things actually that we could still segue into. I want to actually talk about, oh, you know what? Something just came to my mind and, um, let's talk about that. Cause it was actually last week when I realized just how much the mobile phone apps are changing our lives. 
in a way. And I'm not talking only about the games, but about apps as such, because it was a slightly embarrassing story, but I'll, I'm going to tell it anyway, right? So it's embarrassing for a very simple reason, because it's just very irrational. And uh, yeah. anyway, I, last last week I went um, to the music store where I, I needed to buy something for my microphone, for, for the setup, for for the podcast. I didn't really need to buy it. I was I just wanted to buy. It. I thought like I'm going to buy this little extra uh little extra feature for my microphone. Mm-hmm. It doesn't I don't need it, but I want it. So I went into the shop and I bought a piano. I bought a big big old piano of which I <laughs> never played a piano before. I had no yeah. intention of buying one. Yeah. But um, so that's why it's slightly embarrassing because you know, I went in for at, at, to buy like a ten dollar thing that I don't need, and I ended up spending a lot of money on on another thing that I clearly don't need. Yeah. Right? But never mind that. Okay, that's that's all we can. <laughs> that's another discussion. Is that what, the piano in the background? That, that's the piano in the background. Yeah. And by the way. I'm so happy I did it. I, I'm I'm yeah. playing it every day. I'm enjoying it so much. I mean, oh, nice. I, I play music. I play guitar, right? I, I play, I have multiple guitars. I play lots of them. Um, never had a piano. I tried yeah. keyboards before, but I never really got into it. So spontaneously, I bought this one and uh, I'm enjoying it so much. I'm just wasting basically a lot of my day by just uh, plucking away and uh, having a lot of fun. But, why I started this is because, well, first thing I did when I, well, I set it up, I, you know, here it is, I put it in my office and then I was like, okay, now what, where do I start? And the first thing I did, I was just basically went on the app store and I, I bought a training app for, for the piano mm-hmm. on the mobile phone. And mm. it's incredible. And of course it's the training app that helps you learn how to play the piano, but it's it's built in a way. It's as if it's almost as if it's a game, you know, because yeah. there there's levels, there's this, then the courses and and such, and yeah. it's, it's designed beautifully. I, I don't remember the name of the. I think it's simply piano or simple piano, something mm-hmm. like that. It was the most popular on the app store, and it's definitely an amazing app, and I'm really enjoying it. Um, but it's just incredible to think that so many things. Are just being solved by an app on your phone, and in surprising ways. Like before, you would you would have a piano. You you need a proper teacher to come over and, and show you. Because well, you know, sure. Nowadays, there's the YouTube videos. You can just watch some instructional stuff. That's not really going to get you there because that control part is is missing. You know, nobody's. Yeah. You, know, you have to control yourself, whether you're making mistakes, whether your technique is correct, you know, um, and, and music, obviously, it's not all about the notes. It's about the rhythm. It's about, uh, you know, the precision, et cetera, et cetera. So it's interesting. And where do you see this trend going? Because more and more of our lives are transferred to the mobile phone. Where does it, where, where will it go? Um, well, yeah, that's interesting to think about because you, you know, some companies like Google's talked about having a, a computer in your brain. Um, of course I just saw an article where Apple has their own glasses. Now mm-hmm. they basically just create recreates the iPhone screen like everywhere. Um, so I think it seems the trend is going more and more into integrating technology into your body which I don't know if I'm too on board with. I, I like the separation because I always think, well, hackers hack everything. What if they hack your this brain chip and you start hearing voices that aren't really voices because there's an audio thing there and, and you think, I mean, it just just seems like there's, you know, it seems so it seems like things are going to where they're, they're trying to integrate uh, biological with, tech, uh, with, uh, with digital technology more and more. But I mean, I couldn't say for sure. It just seems it seems for sure games and apps are going more, um, more um, in a seamless fashion to where you just you know maybe it'll just be uh, it'll go VR or augmented reality, 
more hands off to where, you know, you don't even have to, maybe you just have to think and you can actually move things around in front of you just by, by that. And you don't even have to use your hands for a lot of things anymore. So I guess they, I guess um, with apps and everything, it just seems like it's going, they want to integrate more and more types of products with apps. Um, you know, like you have an app for a lot of the functions in the house now, thermostat, um, you know, they're, they make smart fridges. So it seems like they want more and more things to be integrated with, with uh, digital technology that can be utilized via an app. And then it seems like the apps in, in, in turn are going to be more and more hands off and more just like visual, maybe more controlled by audio cues or I, who knows, maybe eye cues or mental cues that, because it seems like they're working on all that kind of technology. Um, how fast that'll happen, I don't know. I mean, it it uh, it's a, it, it, it's kind of kind of more speculation on my my end because I'm I'm mainly focused on. There's all these kind of aspects of the app industry you could kind of go into a rabbit hole for. And um, if you're the person who's like, okay, apps are this today, but tomorrow they need to be this. That person is not really thinking about games and the guy who's thinking about games isn't necessarily thinking about the overall broad spectrum. So, um, yeah, for me, it's more kind of, I think this, I think that, but I'm not a hundred percent. Um, it, it'd be something more, you know, it's de definitely a bit outside my realm, but it's, I think for everyone, it's pretty fascinating to see how that's all going to evolve. But that's what, that's what my best guesses would be is just, is those, I guess, main, main ideas. Yeah. And it's interesting that, you know, some of the biggest uh, poker sites out there are already experimenting with the VR and trying to introduce oh, really? that, that, that as well. Sense. Yeah. I can see never that. Augmented tried. reality. What if we're all like, you think augmented reality, what if I'm sitting here at my, my uh, regular table and all this augmented reality covers it with what looks like the green felt and the poker chips and this and that. And I can see what if I'm playing against Doc Holliday or Richard Turner or you or all these people. Maybe you're alive and maybe this other person has an avatar that looks like Doc Holliday, but mm -hmm. it's a real person. Right. So I think there's a lot of really cool things you could do with VR or AR that you can't do. Um, physically, unless someone was dressing up with, you know, makeup and putting on a costume if they wanted to be, be a character. Or something. But <laughs> you have AI, you're against an AI Doc Holliday or an AI uh, historical figure. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I could, there's so many ways you could take that. So I think that I would, I mean, not being a poker player, if that was, if there were experiences similar to what I'm talking about, I'd probably play it just to experience mm -hmm. that. That'd be that sounds fun to me. Yeah, I think that's what some of those poker sites are actually banking on, that they're going to attract an audience that is not into poker otherwise, but they would love yeah. to have that experience because, you know, from one perspective, if we think about poker as a social game, some people would frown upon the idea of, oh, I don't want to play online. Seems a bit boring. Yeah. I would love to play in a casino, yet I don't want to step foot in the casino because I don't like the whole concept of a casino i don't like the whole atmosphere you know just don't like right. casinos but the virtual reality would allow you to experience the casino environment sort of thing while actually or the augmented reality while while actually in, enjoying the game so yeah that yeah. that probably would be a very exciting feature it remains to be seen whether they're going to be able to do it with real money as in you know, real poker where you can actually bet real money and win real money or lose real money. But yeah, at least as a form of entertainment, that's definitely plausible and it's definitely something they're working on. And, you know, I'm quite curious to see where, where that's going to lead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's going to be interesting. Yeah. We, yeah, I, I'm sure there's some fun experiences around the corner for all that. And then for VR in general, because, you know, uh, it'd be really fun to actually be Luke Skywalker going through the movie, which you're going through the actual movie in a VR experience as opposed to just watching it. There's, it's a much more 
powerful experience to actually feel like you're there than to just mm. watch these people doing these these crazy things. So, yeah. and and if you've ever there's a VR system called the Void where they put like a laptop on and a backpack that you wear and you got the VR. And so I did I did it at Disneyland. They had it where you're a stormtrooper. And it was pretty fun. I mean, I could see how it can get a lot better, but for what it was, it was pretty cool. And I remember a friend of mine, there's a part cause you're all, you're playing with friends. You look at them, they're, they're a stormtrooper and they're waving. It's pretty cool. And so we got in this elevator at one part and he, he forgot that where he was didn't exist because he leaned against the elevator and fell through onto the ground. And you heard, you heard all the employees laughing. And, uh, and even though you knew it was a VR experience and it wasn't, it didn't look like, like what we see right now, which is where it's going. It's going to look completely hundred percent real. He still forgot that it was not real. And he, he got lost in it because he leaned against the elevator and fell on the ground. Wow. Funny how the mind works. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and let's not even open up the can of worms. That is the discussion, whether we live in a simulation or not. But, you know, the closer Uh-oh. we get to this uh, really realistic VR, uh, the more fire to, the, to those discussions. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I think I think things could get too real. I mean, I do not need the experience of feeling like Freddy Krueger is really coming from the ground and is starting to stab me with his claws. You'll you could you could honestly have situations where people have heart attacks because the exper- mm-hmm. like I played a game on one of those it was like a VR headset where you put the Android phone right here. And they had a game on their app store where you would just stand at the bottom of the ocean and you'd see uh, ocean creatures swimming around. It was really cool. It wasn't realistic, but you felt like you were there. And it was it got creepy when there was a great shark or they had different environments. One, there was dolphins, which is cool. And then, and then there was another one where you were in the very deep ocean and you saw like, tentacles in the distance kind of coming in and out of this dark water and it actually was pretty creepy for those those things and i was just like wow can you imagine when it's real just feels real and there's a great white coming at you and trying to bite you mm-hmm. you could people could really die because they're having a heart attack because your body's actually it's like the matrix you know when they say you die in the matrix you die in the real world and I think that will actually happen where if the experience, if your body feels like it's actually experiencing this, it'll have that reaction mm. and then a consequence. So yeah. it, it is crazy that it could be that serious, but I think it could be. Well, absolutely. Because even if we think back to, well, don't think back, but just think about uh, skydiving, for example. You know, people who, yeah. you know, if your shoot fails and the reserve fails, you're going to die, but you're going to die of heart attack. You know, you're going to die way before impact because it's just, you know, too much stress. And most people who die in, uh, in those accidents, they die of a heart attack. I hope oh, I'm not I making this up. I, I think that's accurate. I mean, I'm not no expert on the subject, but yeah, that much I know that you're unlikely to, to actually be alive by the time when you hit that ground if your yeah. shoe didn't open. Right. And so the same thing, if you're in the VR experiencing this immense stress where you your mind believes that's it, we're, we're done. Yeah. It's just way too much stress and, 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 and that's it. Yeah, that's going to be interesting. Yeah. Uh, so I will, I will definitely be wary of which VR games I play. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And one thing that you've mentioned about the movies, you know, and how the movies are going to transform as well, because now we see it with the video games, like the like the PlayStation games and and such, where you know the character based games, where you're basically living a movie, you're you're living a story, and you're an actively actively taking part of it. It's going to be just so amazing with the VR. 
and yeah maybe i don't know movie industry is going to change or it's going to be just the subculture and the mainstream because mainstream definitely is going to be the part where you're partaking in the whole experience living yeah. living the the experience and and it's going to be a completely different art form it's going to be quite interesting to see what happens yeah. there yeah, I and I, I mean, again, I'm I'm only one to speculate. I I I couldn't predict exactly what it's going to look look like, but it it uh, it should be pretty, pretty pretty fun. And whatever it evolves into, it's going to be pretty cool. I think. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, David, I want to ask you about what would be the advice you could give somebody, somebody who is trying to figure out. What is, I, I don't want to say purpose because that seems too grandiose. What should they be doing? What have you learned from your experience? You know, your experience of failing 40 times yet still pursuing the thing that you believed is your thing. Like, what would you suggest to somebody who is not sure sort of which direction they should be digging? What should they be pursuing? Do you have any advice? Uh, yeah, it's just, the main thing is experience new things because only through experiencing something will you realize that you like it or you don't like it. And like I said, I never, I never designed anything as far as intentionally. Um, I never thought I would be a game designer or be making games until I think I was 33 at the time when I got introduced to the idea of making games and then instantly because I experienced that, uh, I right then and there decided, Oh, I'm going to make games. So that's the key is the, one of the main keys is just get outside of your normal routines, experience something new and keep doing that. till one of those experiences create ignites something inside of you where you're, where you can feel like this passion that you didn't have before. Mm-hmm. and then explore that and then along the way you just have to there's always failures like like they just come in different forms every time you do something new you're going to fail but it's a good thing it's just a sign that you're doing something new and then and then the point is like we were saying earlier don't just do the same thing over and over but learn something new to apply to your actions so you can have a different result gradually over time and um you know, be willing to keep learning and keep failing because no matter how many times you succeed, you'll fail way more, you know, like way more times will you be failing than you'll succeed. But you only need it. One success, one big success is worth 10,000 failures. So yeah, so that's the good news. You don't have to, you don't have to succeed 10,000 times. You just got to do it once. Minimum. That's great advice. Yeah. Um, and obviously I know that you're going to be bringing out courses for people who want to study game design. That's, that's going to yeah. happen, happen after you, you've published it, you, you've done your work with the uh, color switch too. Um, so I think if some of the listeners are actually interested to explore a new hobby or, you know, at least learn something about, you know, this, this field, because for you, what happened is you saw your roommate on a computer doing this thing and you thought, well, yeah, that's great. Yeah. So somebody might just see your course and it might change their life after, you know, 50, 60, 100 failures. If they stick around, you know, it just might. But, you know, if, if it does allow them to, to find a new field to express themselves, that would be, that would be a beautiful thing. Of course, some of yeah, the books that you've mentioned as well, I'm going to put in the show notes. And uh, and speaking of Color Switch 2, when is that coming out? Well, it's technically out right now. Um, it's on Google Play and Apple. Uh, the cool thing about games is if you launch it, usually you, you launch it and you, um, you, know, you, you tweak your marketing before you start promoting it. And just like I was saying earlier, um, like Candy Crush, you know, it's been on the top grossing charts for many years. It's kind of like having a, a number one movie every weekend. Um, 
with a game, it's not in, it's not important as soon as it is on a platform for it to be at the top, like a movie. It's very important for a movie. I think everyone knows that. So you have the ability to fix bugs, um, get some user feedback from the people who do download it and fix any kind of like critical things that you're noticing a lot of people are making comments on. Um, and then when you fine tune all that and, and you fine tune, okay, people are responding to this ad more than this type of ad, then you start marketing it from that point. So it's on the app store, but I think we're, we're almost done with our testing. So we'll, we'll probably start marketing it in like a day or two. All right. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the pretty cool thing about digital products is you can kind of, it's always a work in progress and from the beginning till years later. Mm -hmm. And what about the course? When is that going to be available for people? Well, people can go to colorswitchacademy.com and they can sign up for our email list. And, um, I don't know if I have a hard date yet. We, I mean, we have most of the content's already done. We actually have a couple, um, students, because we did a, a soft launch earlier in the year just to get a handful of people. And, uh, and, uh, so probably I'm going to, I'm going to guess what, what's, what is it now? It's July, probably somewhere in September, October, we're actually going to, going to get that going after the game has been marketed for a couple months. Mm -hmm. Cause then I'm going to actually work. Cause I didn't, when I made some of the material for the course, I didn't have the game finished at that point. So I'm going to actually work in the behind the scenes of how I kind of evolved the design for this and kind of put it into the marketing as well. So, so sometime later this, this fall. Okay. Sounds good. And I'm yep. going to, like I said, I'm going to put all the links in the show notes, uh, for everyone to, to see and find. Uh, anywhere else they can uh, find you some social media yeah i have facebook um just you just have to type in my name and you'll see my color switch icon right. pop up or have instagram um where i'm mr color switch there mr color and switch that's very sweet mr color switch yeah. <laughs> uh, those are the main ones all right or linkedin i'm on linkedin too Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll put I usually everything. check business stuff on that. Yeah, I'll put everything out there for people that want to connect or follow you. Um, I'm definitely going to follow the the progress of Color Switch too. I'm I'm interested in seeing because to me, one thing we didn't touch upon, right? But I think that's going to be out of the scope of of our conversation is is the fact that you know when you first published color switch you had a company behind it the publishing company that that helped you with all those things and now obviously with color switch 2 you're doing it yourself obviously while already having a lot of experience with these things and in the business yeah. and you know you have a something to fall back on in terms of experience and understanding of how the whole business works but um, yeah. i think for you that's that, that has to be a bit exciting right to to actually sure. do it in yeah, another way yeah, because um, you know you're when you're not with a publisher, you're not having to sure you know like if you're an author of a book, the publisher is supposed to distribute it to a wider audience, but you also have to you know there's there's a cost to that where you'll be splitting revenue to some extent. So so the cool thing is now we have a worldwide brand that is um, recognized in a lot of places, I think we went number one, like 130 countries when it was, uh, first out the first couple of years. And so now we have this brand that people are familiar with and there's a lot of stuff to do with it. And, you know, we're coming out with the, we've come out with the sequel, but we're, we have, we're in, we're, we have in the works another three, um, color switch games that are going to come out in the next coming months that this game took a lot longer to develop. So there's going to be a, you're going to also, you should also watch how we kind of stretch the brand. Cause I think of it like what Nintendo does with Mario, for example, Mario first came out in Donkey Kong. He was just like this jumping plumber guy. And now you have Mario Odyssey. You have these immersive 3d worlds where you're going to all different planets and everything. But if you look at what he used to be, 
it's nothing compared to what he is now. So they evolved um, that character and that brand and that franchise in all sorts of ways. And they're, they're one of the best companies for video games that do that. So I have the insane, the same intention with color switch and because it's so minimalistic, we can get very specific or we can stay minimalistic. There's a, there's a infinite amount of ways to stretch the brand where some brands, it's kind of hard for them to do that because if you start specific, um, it's kind of hard to to stretch it in a variety of ways, but because we're so unspecific, it's kind of like the T-1000 in Terminator 2. Mm-hmm. His natural state is liquid metal, but he can become the, the policeman or the this person or that person. So we that's kind of how we are. Our, our natural state is this unspecific state, and then we can become whatever we need to become with the mm-hmm. brand. Right. And that flexibility is probably really useful for marketing because now you can tap into different yeah, different groups of people. You know, yeah. you're gonna have probably a core group who are gonna be the true believers of the first form of a simple version. And then there's gonna mm-hmm. be the Odyssey kind of people who are gonna just in, enjoy yep. the the more more uh, immersive or I don't know how to describe well. More bell, bells and whistles and, and such, you know, so sort sure. of going going away from the original. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So it'll, it'll be fun. I, there's a lot of ideas I already have, and we've already started building a couple of them, and it'll be, it'll be fun to, yeah, to explore all that. Well, fantastic. David, I want to thank you for, for your time. It was uh, such a blast. And, and the funny thing is that, you know, we... We started recording only like an hour and uh, hour and fifteen minutes into right. the conversation, and, and the first part yeah. was really enjoyable as well. And part of it is recorded, so I'm sure we're gonna either leave it in or or just leave it as a special episode somewhere for people to find. So I'm, I'm obviously we'll decide on that, and, and we'll see. But yeah, th- thank you so much for for the time. Awesome. Yeah, thank you very much as well for having me and sharing your time. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to get a regular email from me personally where I share my key takeaways from each latest episode, go to runchexpodcast.com and subscribe to my newsletter. And of course, I would really appreciate if you subscribe to my channel on YouTube and rate my podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or any other platform where you normally listen to your podcasts. This really helps.